All right, guys. So welcome. This is uh, the Applied Economics Workshop. I'm Ryan. I'm your host. Uh, today, we're going to have Jay Coggins, one of the faculty here in the Applied Economics Department. He's going to be talking about how we go from theoretical models and putting them into practice. So how you as students and me can take ideas and stuff that we've seen in class and put some traction behind that and really make new contributions to the science that isn't just empirical, but it's theoretical as well. Um, Jay is a professor of environment, and then he's, of course, a professor of welfare. So if those are some topics that you're interested in, uh, certainly reach out to Jay. Um, all right. And then the floor is all yours, Jay. So let's welcome Jay. Thank you, Ryan. Um, my goal is to tell you about a paper. And along the way, explain some of the ways that at least I do theory papers. There will be zero evidence or data in this paper. And it starts from an, a bedrock principle of environmental economics, which I've been writing about for my whole career. And that is that there is an object called an abatement cost function. And it tells what it will cost a company, a polluter, to reduce their emissions of pollution. And it's really simple. First, it depends only on either emissions, like in tons or pounds or millions of tons, or else abatement, they're the, like they really, one is emissions, initial emissions minus how much I emit after my controls is how much I reduce. So if I started at putting 70,000 tons of SO2 in the air, and then after some policy, I'm down at 50,000 tons, of course, A is 20,000. But the idea is, as emissions fall or as abate, abatement goes up, it costs money. And moreover, this is all we need to know about the polluter. So my goal here isn't to explain my environmental economics to you. My goal is to explain how a theory paper can develop, at least how I've done it. But this is a bed workhorse framework way of understanding the pollution problem. Tons and tons of papers, most of the ones I've written do this. They simplify an entire operation of a company, a polluting an entity, down to one little function that depends only on emissions. Not all the inputs, the marketing division, costs of all the inputs, none of that. Here's an example of a famous permit trading, cap and trade paper from 40 years ago where let the cost function of Q is emissions here, B, the abatement cost function, that's the whole paper is based on that. Another famous, I do permit trading stuff a lot, or have. Um, here's from the AER. Alan McCartney is on this paper. He's now the head economist at the UK. Here's one I wrote with a former student. Blasky was on this, Chris Costello. Again, everything's based on a cost function, marginal cost here, depending only on the quantity of uh, the abatement in this case, Q is abatement. So the idea is if you reduce pollution, it costs you money for sure. And I was at, I was at the World Bank some years ago, well, it's been a decade now, giving a paper about something else. And I got talking with my host, who was this Swedish economist, Strand, and he was <clears throat> telling me about the European Union's new directive to require all airline carriers serving the continent to participate in the European Union's carbon trading system. And the American Airlines put up a terrible. The US-based carriers, Delta, put up a tremendous fuss. They hated this. Don't make us join this. Don't make us reduce our carbon emissions. And the guy I was talking to said, they're so silly, they should be happy because if they joined, their profits would go up. And I thought, that's wacky. Everyone knows if they're pollution, if they have to reduce pollution, that will cost money. That cost function I showed you is always upward slope. Their directive was called 2008 slash 101 slash EC. And this is what the United States did about it. 
U.S. Congress passed an actual bill, Obama signed it in 2012, to prohibit operators of civil aircraft in the United States from participating in this thing. On this side, Ryan, do you think the mic is okay? Um, yeah, if, uh, yeah, I'll make sure they can still hear. You can keep on going. So, my first reaction to the claim that this person was making was that he was wacky. But that evening, I got to thinking about it and wondered, wait, could this be true? It would violate another bedrock principle if it was true. If when we clamp down on polluters, they make more profits, that violates this polluter pays principle, which is the bad guys should be the ones who pay for cleanup. It shouldn't be the, everyone else, the victims, the customers. Um, and if, if this was possible, why aren't they already doing it? Why aren't they emitting, emitting less now? Well, I was spending the night with an old friend, also a former student in this department, in Virginia, and we got talking and uh, sketching some diagrams, I think, about these problems graphically, and by the end of the evening, I began to think, wait a second, this might be true, which I should have known. Windfall profits is the term for this. The EPA tightens a pollution standard, makes you clean up, profits go up, that's a windfall. And I was in a, a little research group of some students that took a class from me once, mostly, and I tried out this idea on them and they thought, well, yeah, let's see if we can make a paper out of that question. And what I want to tell you about is that paper. And along the way, I'll explain some tips and advice about how to do theory papers, if you're interested. There's still a market for them, I guess, although it's not like when I was in grad school. Those were the hot all the big studs were doing theory. Nobel Prize is going to people proving theorems. And now it's not so much like that. But we ran into difficulties. We got the paper rejected at two top journals. It finally got accepted by the third one we tried. This is the paper, Environmental and Resource Economics. It's not the top, we got it rejected by the top two, ended up in this one. Top two field journals. So, um, that evening, evening conversation I had involved a lot of diagrams, discussion. The guy I was talking to then was super smart, dude. Um, if you're willing to apply some restrictions, you get the result that my Swedish acquaintance was arguing for. So long as the only way to reduce pollution is by reducing output. There's no new fancy machine to add, no wing tips on your airplane, no scrubber or filter. If, you, if the only way to reduce pollution is, you know, every flight emits some carbon, if you want to reduce less carbon, you've got to buy fewer flights. That's this. The marginal cost of output has to be increasing, okay? And the required reduction emissions can't be too big. So for a, some range of, of emissions reduction, you'll get this weird result that the firms, the polluters, the bad guys are richer afterwards. Here's the way we conceived of the question. There's a demand function for some output Y and an aggregate marginal cost curve for the polluters in the industry. And then emissions are disproportionate to Output. It doesn't have to be a straight line, but we said it's linear. So now, if you think about it, if you're going to pollute less, you have no choice but to produce less output. But moving Y to the left in this left diagram means to clear the market, the price has to go up. So it's kind of conferring something very close to monopoly rents on the bad guys. Here's what happens. Area B is an increase in profit due to the price increase. Area C is a loss in profit because quantity went down. And in this case, it looks to me like the rectangle B is bigger than the triangle C. 
So as a result of the pollution restriction, Y went down, P went up, profits went up. Okay, this is part one of the paper. This one is pretty obvious. What if the policy isn't a quantity restriction where airplane com airline companies just get told to pollute less, period? What if there's a tax on emissions instead? And let's say it's enough of a tax to drive a wedge in here to achieve exactly the same amount of output. Turns out the pancake windfall profits there. Or we also consider the situation where emissions aren't proportional to output, instead they're proportional to some input. If you burn twice as much coal, you emit twice as much carbon. Same sort of idea. What if, what if a restriction is put on pollution in a case where pollution is proportional to the input? This question isn't so much studied in the literature. Some of what we had to say was new. And then also, what if the EPA, which they don't, the EPA are smart, but what if they fail to account for this, this sort of monopoly price increase thing? As they're setting policy, would they get the policy choice wrong, the level of pollution? Here's the tax case. Profit in the beginning was A plus C, remember? Profit after the tax becomes A definitely goes down. Tax takes away all that potential increased profit plus some from consumers. I'm going to get to the theorems that establish all of this and tell you how we developed them and what was interesting in them. If there's no chance for the price to increase, here a good example would be like a, a small watershed, a couple dozen farms, the groundwater is polluted in that area. They grow corn and soybeans. And in order to clean up the water in that area, the groundwater that neighbors drink, and they drink. A restriction is put on pollution. And in order to pollute less nitrates in the groundwater, they have to grow less corn. Well, they are a tiny fraction of a massive corn market. So the corn price isn't going to change just because these few farmers pollute less. That's this case. And if the output price doesn't change, definitely profits go down. C is a slice off of that original profit region. Now, the restriction on pollution, where when I say quantity restriction, I mean all the polluters in the industry get a letter from the EPA say telling them, hey, reduce your pollution. It's bad. As opposed to the tax. Well, this story is more complicated mathematically, more interesting. It was a harder thing for us to figure out. But this diagram explains it. In the input market for the one polluting input, like coal, fuel, fertilizer, in the beginning, we have a demand for the input. And let's say this is the only industry that uses that input. Fertilizer, coal, which is never true. There's a demand for the input. There's a supply of the input from uh, coal miners. And there's an equilibrium price and quantity of the input. And then off to the side, the EPA tells this firm, the industry pollute less. Well, now the price of their input, because they're buying less of it, the price of the input goes down, their demand for it goes down, and that drives the price down along this supply curve. So now they're kind of making extra profit because their input got cheaper. Or we can look at it in the output picture with this marginal cur cost curve shifting down because the price of the important input got smaller. And uh, Something that stumped us for a while is, should we be looking at this region, the pink region is kind of a slice of increased profits and integral between two input prices with a little bit of loss? Or should we be looking over here in the output market because this is a 
pink is also a bump, an increase in profit because of lower, the lower price of the input. So we had to figure out which one of these to use. The answer is they're the same, doesn't matter. Okay, just quick, now background. I'm, I'm again trying to motivate where interesting questions might come out if you think you'd like to do a theory and publish it. We had to put our argument, our findings in the perspective of a literature in which, like I said, tons and tons of papers do this thing that started to look, for some cases at least, like they might be mistaken, including a bunch of papers I published. So I included, we included articles I published in our list of the articles we were dinging and saying, you guys got this wrong, you missed something. But here's a famous paper from 1972 in which a guy called Montgomery uh, wrote an article for Jet. It was, his, it was his dissertation making claims, establishing that a trading system for pollution, a cap and trade system has wonderful properties mathematically. And the way he configured, the built the, the model was to say, without regulation, polluting, Companies produce a bunch of outputs, they have a cost function, and it also depends on emissions. Their profit is revenue minus cost with a bar. And then the EPA comes along or somebody who changes E and tells them you must pollute less. They reorganize their operation, they produce a new vector of outputs, and they get a different profit level. And the difference between them is Montgomery's abatement cost function. This is the first one I know of that did this. And tons and tons of people have followed him in employing a cost function that just depends on emissions, but buried in it, embedded in it, is all this reorganization of the operation to respond optimally to change. And he was super clear about what he was doing. There's end sources, the fixing location, they maximize profits, and the prices and input and of outputs and inputs are fixed because they're small compared to the bigger economy. He's explicit that prices are not changing. Input or output prices. Thus, we can any this. Here's a paper that followed Montgomery and actually says we are assuming prices don't change. But not everyone says that. There are papers that use the same device. Depends on E here. This is a really highly cited paper. But they claim because the product market is assumed to be competitive, we don't need to worry about output choices. They're implicitly accounted for in the abatement cost function. This statement is not true. In fact, you need to worry about output market support. That's the point of our paper. And we thought it was a worthwhile idea to say this carefully and maybe publish an article that has zero data, just theorems and proofs. So after we worked a while to try to figure out what we thought was going on, we started writing a paper and that involves developing notation. Um, by the way, there's, there's the conceptual section the conceptual model of a fundamentally empirical paper. And that's really attractive, like for a job market. There will be people who read your paper or who are in the audience at an interview seminar who are going to be much happier with you if they see some theory. Old school people like me. A lot of other people don't care. Show me your identification strategy. Okay. Publishing a pure theory paper is different than that. You gotta say something new. There has to be something about the mathematics that is subtle enough to be convincing and interesting to a reviewer group. Um, so there's a lot more, a higher standard put on like developing your assumptions carefully, laying out every detail, and here are our details. Identical firms, that just means there will be no trading of the permits because they're identical. So we take that possible explanation of the thing out of the picture. They use a bunch of inputs. 
This produces a single output according to this production function f of the vector of inputs x. f is continue has continuous third derivatives, and then this cross partial thing, positive cross partials for all inputs. One pollutant is emitted at a fixed rate. Yeah, right. So this is a question I have about when you're starting to develop an idea and put that into mathematical notation. When I read a paper, there's all these primitives, just like this. I'm assuming that those come after you've done a lot of messy, oh, now I need to say this at the beginning yeah, yeah. to make sure that this is consistent. Yeah, I was looking through my notes as we as I got ready for this from back in like 2016 or whatever it was. And yeah, they're a mess. Lots of dead ends. Lots of sharing emails. Do you, do you think it'll be? No. Somebody else says, no, I don't think it looks that way. Yeah, lots of messiness behind the scenes before we boil it down to, okay, here's our notation. Here's what we need to say. Uh, by the way, these two assumptions here, continuous third derivative? That's weird. Um, something about the cross partials of the production function? Who ever heard of worrying about that? We'll see that it turns out to be super important for our argument. And I'm going to observe later in another slide that this sort of thing will be noticed by reviewers. That's weird. You better use that assumption. In fact, you better use all of these. They better be essential to some part of your argument. Otherwise, don't say them. One pollutant, the fixed rate thing makes the math easier. It could be just any monotonic upward sloping function, but we felt like it was useful to point out all these other people, including someone who won a Nobel Prize, who did exactly that, to sort of inoculate ourselves against a complaint, which we got it anyway. One input, X1, is the polluting input. It's few. And the industry is small at first relative to its input market, so fuel, labor, capital, all of this, they're small. The price doesn't change when they change their use of that input. We're gonna let them change that in a moment. And there's a nice demand for why. Firms have a cost function. It minimizes the cost of an input vector to produce Y for any given Y and price vector. It's increasing, it's well behaved. Costs are the horizontal sum of individual costs. There's no entry or exit. You're bound to get a reviewer who hates this. Whatever. In the long run, what did he say? We're all bad. There you go. In the, so we have an initial situation. And again, if you read our paper, it's really detailed, really specific. There's no environmental regulation. All these polluters just Ignore pollution and maximize profit, just like in Montgomery. When they take prices as given and maximize profit, there's an initial output level, Y0. It's where demand and supply are equal. And there's a price. And emissions by chance just come out at beta times Y0. There's profits in the beginning, pi zero. And then there's the question, how do they change? So we've got our framework all set up and we can start asking the questions about how profits change when the EPA imposes a new restriction on this industry. Two policy options. One is the EPA just tells people cut pollution by say 20% from where you started. And they're gonna measure or you're gonna measure, you go to jail if you break this law. Ours would, would be in that case 0.8. It's somewhere between one, which is no change, and zero, which would say no pollution at all. So a 20% reduction would be R of 0.8. Emissions fall by that ratio, that fraction. Output must fall by the same fraction, according to our setup. And there's a new price at this new output level. Profits change, the change in profits is delta pi, or the quantity restriction on the other policy is a tax. And we can figure out for any given R, an equivalent tax to achieve the same reduction in pollution. 
There's a new profit level. Of course, the taxes come out of profit. I haven't written that down here. And there's a change, delta pi of T, the tax. There's also a damage function for the social welfare part. It's monetary damages for any given level of emissions. People are coughing and sick and hospitalized. Some of them are dead. This function is nice though, differentiable. Right. Curvature, damages are increasing. Marginal damages are increasing. What should a regulator do? The optimal policy is gonna be a question. So at this point in the paper, you've read six or eight pages or whatever. The framework is established. We've imposed a bunch of assumptions. All of them are important or we wouldn't have said them. Those that are not obvious are gonna be especially noticed. Why do we need the third derivative to be continuous? Well, I'm gonna to get to that. I'll explain that one of our results, some of the more interesting parts of this paper have to do with these two. So we didn't put them there because we wanted to, in fact. We kind of re reverse engineered them from another insight that we had together. I'll get to it. Yes, please. Um, on defending the um, assumptions, mm -hmm. what in your experience is more valuable? Saying, well, this happens in practice. Here are like two examples from practice, how this looks like, or this happened in these three other papers. So practice versus theory to defend the assumptions. If you can find other papers who made the sort of unsavory assumption that you find you have no choice but to make, or you decide to make because it just makes the analysis so much cleaner, lean heavily on the Nobel winners if you can find them. You know, I, we listed like seven articles we found that did the exact same E is beta times Y thing. Um, nobody does this. In fact, we didn't even say anything other than we're assuming this. And nobody complained about that. We were fortunate, I guess. Um, we used it in the proof in a way that I hope careful reviewers figured out for themselves. I'm going to explain it to you, but um, it's the luck of the draw. Some reviewers are just, you know, like totally focused on one thing they hate. And if you say that one thing, you're toast. Try a different journal. I hope you get someone else. But if others have done it, I think that's the most effective argument. Don't impose an instruction you don't use explicitly. All right, here's a proposition. Um, this is the first section of the paper where the pollution is proportional to output and only the output price can change. The input prices are all fixed. And we're saying, consider a competitive polluting industry satisfying the assumptions above, which there are, I don't know, a dozen significant ones. We don't list them here. Suppose in just now we are listing a few that are crucial. Industry supply is downward sloping, industry marginal cost is upward sloping, and input prices are fixed. Those three we listed in the theorem itself because they're really important. Number one, there is an R tilde, some threshold R, so that profit, if the envir environmental regulation is that number, R tilde, aggregate profit doesn't change. If industry profit is strictly concave in R, we show when it is, R bar R tilde is unique. And there's windfall profit, delta pi R pi is above zero for any R in that interval from one down to this threshold we talk about R tilde. We don't put this in the paper, but this is all that's going on if you like a diagram. Here's pi in the beginning. Here's zero. Profit does that with all of our curvature assumptions. They're essential. 
And here's R tilde. We didn't put that figure in the paper, but that's all that's going on. Um, for any T bigger than zero, profits are going to go down in this setup. There cannot be windfall profits in that case. So if, if you don't like polluters, the bad guys getting better off because of your pollution po uh, policy, maybe a tax is a good idea. In the absence of output price effects, price of corn doesn't change, there definitely cannot be windfall profits. This is the Montgomery case. This is the one that's implicitly assumed in all those papers, including a bunch of mine. And in this case, it's, it's sensible to say the lost profits because of the pollution policy represent cost of abatement, foregone profits. Here's the proof of that proposition, part one. So it's in an appendix. It probably could be more efficient. But this is how much math we felt we needed to make the case convincingly that, yeah, the first part is true. There's an R tilde. First, we show the derivative of pi with respect to R is downward sloping at one. So for a while, at least, profit is going up when R moves left of one. It might just be for a little while, but that first is downward sloping at one. Okay, plus. So then we get the second derivative of pi must be strictly negative. So it can't do something squiggly. The range where profits increase is a single interval. Anyway, this is the extent of language it, we felt it took to really nail down the first part of that theorem proposition. And I didn't do the, the but understand that what's going on here is, doesn't go beyond calc two, okay? There's no fancy fixed point topology something or other. It's carefully reasoning through sort of comparative statics grade micro. And the tax part is more straightforward than this. And the third part of the proposition, even more straightforward. So this proof did not, is not why the paper got published. Yeah. So I have a question about like functional. So like when you're developing your theory, you're taking your idea, you start with some standard like Montgomery, and then you start messing with it. You start playing with your idea on it. How do you know that all of this is set up right? Because it feels like I could have a proof and like, yeah, I don't have that curvature. So my statement is true. But did I write it down the right way? Did my idea come in the right package? Now, when I heard you say functional form, I thought you were going to say, what if we had had no choice but to say, like, the For sure. the underlying production function is Cobb Douglas. And if it's Cobb Douglas, then everything we say is correct. Otherwise, we don't know. Um, there is a penalty. In that case, it's not your question, but there, there is a penalty you incur in your chances of publishing or in the level of journal in which you can publish a paper as you make your functional form assumptions more restricted. This is not that. We didn't say cop ducts. We just said those weird cross partials are a certain sign. And it's strictly concave, which gives us profit. Realize if we said cop Douglas linear returns to scale, profit would be zero in the beginning and not interesting. So we had to say strictly concave. We never mentioned that. We're assuming our readers understand that. Um, now, maybe I can help with your question by saying along the way, believe me, we did, this is the way I think about it. I think about these problems graphically. I like taking an example into Excel and just plotting the heck out of it. Many, many versions. Okay. Did it still do the same thing if I changed that coefficient to 0.15? I get a graphical geometric understanding. Manlene here doesn't do that. She just needs the equations. I'm working on paper with her. So I've worked with on people, papers with a lot of people who do not get an insight from the graphs that I make. What's the equation? Am I answering your question? 
if you can make it make it as general as you can, that will increase your chance of getting published. But the restrictions we put on here, including that strict concavity of F, that's essential. We don't have profit if F is linear, linear returns to scale, cost returns to scale. I guess in the profit function, it makes it a little easier. But like I'm just saying, like, when do you know that something is additively separable? Or when do I say, here's a G function, these things are inputs to this thought, right? There's a behavior that we observe. There's some things that move that behavior. We're going to call them the X vector. How do we know that those X vectors aren't multiplicative? There's no complementarities. There's like, those are like the behind the scene decisions that you read in the paper, but it's unclear how the author came to that conclusion. So when you say G, are you thinking about like yeah. Montgomery's cost function just depending on outputs? This is not in Moscow now. A cost function depends on output and prices. So this is a little bit non-standard and it depends on emissions instead. So in Montgomery's paper, he does pretty much what we did, which is specify very precisely the properties he's saying G must have. And he does not say it's additively separable in a polluting input. So his results did not rely on that assumption, and ours don't either. But if we had gotten stuck along the way and realized, oh, wait a second, this doesn't work unless the production function is additively separable in the polluting input, coal. That might have been a, a wall that we hit. Then we would have had a choice to make. Okay, in order to get anywhere now, we got to make this assumption that we hate. We expect reviewers to hate it too. But to get anywhere on this track, we must make that assumption, and then you, you proceed and you do your best to defend yourself in the paper, hoping that you'll get reviewers who are friendly about it. But there's a risk. The more restrictive, the more restriction, that's why I said don't write, a, don't put an assumption that you don't need, because every single assumption is possibly a trigger point for a reviewer. So we left it as general as we could, and so did Montgomery. By the way, this guy, David Montgomery, wrote this great paper 40 some years ago, 50 years ago, and later on became a roaring uh, climate denier. It has nothing to do with anything. Um, in the EPA, that ignored this was the distributional argument that one, one important reviewer felt made the paper. Put it over the hump. We asked, okay, what if the EPA, which they are not, were silly enough to fail to notice that there are these sort of general equilibrium price effects going on in markets that they control? After all, if we're limiting SO2 from the entire electric utility system in the United States, which the EPA does, that is not very much like a little watershed worth of three dozen corn farmers. There's no doubt that those restrictions applied to entire sectors are going to affect prices everywhere. Let's say the social cost of abatement, when the EPA is smart for any given R, is the integral of that triangle between um, demand and supply. And the optimal policy for a given R will minimize that sum, the deadweight loss, which is, a, we were careful in the paper to remind people, by the way, we're not saying that the initial position with R equal to one is optimal. The, the solution to this is optimal, right? We want that deadweight loss because it's smaller than the avoided damages. But a smart EPA will minimize this object. Uh, I say hapless here, we didn't use that word in the paper. An EPA that forgets to notice the price effect will just hold the price at zero instead of accounting for that entire little triangle. And the point we made is, the theorem says, um, this is dead weight loss. It's not loss, whatever we call it. If the EPA is smart, 
and the blue bit is if the EPA is done. And the point is there's a, a sign to the direction of their mistake. If they're dumb, they will have imposed too much of a relative to the optimal level. And we have a theorem that says this. We have this diagram in the paper. The correct optimum, the optimum chosen by the EPA that forgot to worry about general equilibrium price effects. And here's the theorem. Proposition two, if a regulator seeking to maximize social welfare ignores output price effects, the paper will be too high. And again, this is our proof. This is the whole thing. We tried to be as efficient as we could. Um, but again, this does not involve higher level mathematics. It's careful working through derivative conditions. Thus, this inequality, R is smaller. I'm assuming though, it's not edifying for us to work through this language of these proofs line by line. Would that be correct? Okay. The paper is available. So far, it hasn't been cited thousands of times to my astonishment. I think the real reason people thought this paper was worth publishing eventually, some people got it wrong, was because of the input side of the problem where pollution is still a proportional in proportion to output, but output price doesn't change in response to this industry polluting less or producing less. Instead, some input price changes. So this industry is the only buyer of X, thermal coal, electric utilities. As Y falls, X1, the demand, the entire demand for this input, coal, shifts down. So for any given price, they'll buy less. But this can be increased profit too, in interesting ways. Demand is this, we care about the inverse, the demand for firm for good one, and there's a cost function. But now we really care about W1. Input, this is what I just said. We found that windfall profits occur again due to this input price effect. We're buying this coal together. Coal becomes cheaper. That makes us richer. It can happen. In the case, the first case, rents are flowing from consumers who now pay more airline passengers, to the companies, the pollutants. Here, the rents flow from the coal companies to the pollutants. Different. And I've showed you these diagrams. These appeared in the paper. Um, so that we could explain what was going on. If, it, if I hadn't been an author on the paper, I'm not sure these figures would have been there. My co-authors might have been perfectly happy to just explain the math, but this was my influence, and some readers, I hope, understand this the way I do. Now, our next result is just saying that these two pink areas are identical. So you can evaluate the effect, this... Uh, windfall effect, price effect, either in the output space or in the input space. Um, and that theorem appears in the paper. Shepard's lemma. At least it's not straight from the calculus book. And it did not occur to us immediately, I can tell you, because this, this looked complicated. But eventually between us, we worked out, oh, we can integrate that cost, marginal cost function. And it becomes demand because the derivative of cost with respect to a price, input price is demand. So the integral of marginal cost is you get it back. Um, yeah, so the proof is there. I'm not going to bother you with it. But I'm going to bother you with the main proposition in the interesting input price effect case. This is part one. This is the first 
part of the theorem. And it's not super different than before. There is R tilde where, uh, where profits, delta, the change in profits is zero. If in addition, this is true, that's in the statement of the proposition. We couldn't get our result, then R tilde is unique by something more primitive than this. So this, did, this assumption did not appear up in the top where we developed our model. It just suddenly pops out in the statement of the proposition. Okay, we're dealing with a problem that is not intuitively obvious. It was really messy. It took us weeks and weeks to figure all this out. And finally, all we could say was we reverse engineered this condition. And if this is true, equation eight, then this is true. And this is true. Okay, it's one of a couple places we did this in the paper. Um, is it cheating? I can't look at this and really give an intuitive explanation for the second derivative of cost with respect to output, and then twice the cross derivative of cost, and then x1 times is it? A, hmm, what is that? But anyway, whatever it is, it has to be bigger than the derivative of x, the slope of the demand function, x1. Okay, so. I'm confessing here that that's what we did, and I'm saying it was not fatal to the paper. No reviewer ever complained about this. We reverse engineered the expression we needed, this inequality, or its descendant, and just stuck it in the theorem. Then this is true. Yes. Did you guys put any work in the testing that? And I've seen if it made your ASB true from the end. Like with data? Sorry. Like with data? Yeah, or something. I don't know. Just thinking through the assumptions, like testing how that really needs to be used. Um, well, at the time we were working on this paper, Andrew Goodkind and I did work on and have since written another paper that was very much focused on the an empirical application of all of this to technology adoption and then to a, a problem of corn and nitrous oxide emissions. So we were very much thinking about empirical evidence to guide our conversation, I guess, because we were engaged in those other papers at the same time, he and I. Um, I can't really say though that anything we learned from our empirical journey over here led us to say more affirmatively that, that we think we believe in this inequality. This one is kind of made up. What language should I use? I should be careful. <laughs> what we're saying here is correct mathematically. If this is true, if in addition to all the stuff we've been talking about for pages and pages, if on top of all that, this surprising little inequality that nobody ever talked about before is true, then we get our result. Yeah, I don't know how to... Um, so these are the rules of the road when you're doing theory. You know very well the rules of the road when you're doing causal inference of econometrics, right? Oh, of course, it's right here, of course. It's more than that. Well, theory, uh, which is now more obscure and less glitzy in economics, has its rules too. And we did not break any rules by doing this. We did it again in a much more interesting way in a moment. Oh, um, this is though where we, we use this weird cross partial condition. Um, and it turns out this was a bit of micro that I was not familiar with at the time, but it's a, we found one paper that went into detail on the characteristics of a, of a production function and a cost function, a good an input for which this is true is a normal good. A normal input, we're used to normal goods for consumers. A normal input is one where if output goes up, you use more of that input, not less. 
So this is an alternative way of saying that. In the paper, the text of the paper, we say, we're assuming this. By the way, that means all inputs are normal. So as output goes up, we're using more of everything. That's essential to the theorem, the proof of this, because we need to know what's happening to the input as output goes down. And that tells us which way our demand function shifts. If this weren't true, the, the, everything in that diagram, the, the key point of this diagram, demand might shift out as the output goes down. We don't let that happen with that expression. And this one is not something sort of one-off that we made up. That is a familiar, we had references. Now, the interesting part is this one. What about the text? We, we lost months grappling with this question. Is it possible for a tax on the pollution to generate an increase in profit? It's definitely impossible when the pollution policy is just a restriction on emissions. But if it's a tax, could it happen then? Now, this is the case I showed you before. That's that diagram, but here's the tax diagram. Marginal cost goes down, we expect. Oh, if there's no, yeah, the output price doesn't change. The entire tax rectangle falls below that. And profit is definitely smaller in this diagram, that yellow bit. Hi. And I came up with this diagram. What if in the beginning at the original price of the input, we have this marginal cost curve, the, the upper one with profits yellow. And then as a result of the pollution tax, the marginal cost curve changes so much that it becomes this lower one. And even though this is the block that would be green if I colored it green, this is the tax. Even though the price that they're keeping after paying the tax is much lower, this pink profit wedge is much bigger than before. I produced this diagram. I said, how do we know that can't happen? And if it's possible, we don't have a theorem. We lost months trying to figure out a way mathematically to rule this out. And here's what we came up with. I had this assumption before. The cost function is three times differentiable and the third derivative is continuous. And we used it in this proof, the proof of the tax part of this part of the paper. In some sense, the most interesting thing in the paper. And not only that, we need to be sure that this inequality is true. So here again, we knew what we needed if we could rule out um, the, the first derivative of C with respect to W is demand. And we need to have the slope of the demand curve, the slope of the marginal cost in the output side, not getting bigger as W goes down. So this inequality rules out this possibility that the slope of marginal cost gets bigger as W goes down. So here again, we reverse engineered what we needed. We had language to explain what it meant. I just gave you that language. Unlike in the previous case, that made zero sense to us. We slipped it through. Here, we could invoke Young's theorem. We could invoke you know, Shepard's lemma. We use lots of language that's familiar and that made nobody complain about it, but it makes our proof correct. Um, yeah, well, this is the first part of it. This is just the, oh no, in the, in the statement of, of proposition four, this is the rest of it. We did the quantity first. You want me to stop at five up? Uh, no, you have five minutes. I still have five, good. Um, we did this before. Here's the second. This is the way we stated the proposition. Assume that this inequality is true about the third derivative of C. Then, then, firm for the industry cannot experience increased profits because of the pollution tax. 
Are you going to ask if you have empirical evidence for this? <laughs> no. Actually, in my paper, the other paper, I don't know. The last part of the paper puts the two together, the input price effect, the output price effect, and says in one page, yeah, nothing new, nothing to see here, move along. It's the same. Add them together. And then a, a, a page of conclusion that I still think is maybe the best conclusion I've been part of, sort of makes the plea to people, let's not ignore this. Any policy is going to have general equilibrium effects that ripple out from the industry we're talking about, whether it's through their input chains or output market into the market, other prices are gonna move. It's complicated knowing how any policy will affect the entire economy if you're trying to account for all the general equilibrium ripples. We're just saying, yeah, you have to chop that off somewhere, but let's not chop it off here. Let's at least consider output price effects, one layer, input price effects, one layer. When we quit burning oil, the price of oil is gonna change. What will that do to our attempts to um, reduce carbon emissions by more electric vehicles? Uh, oil's really cheap, so do they buy electric vehicles in this global south? See, that's a general equilibrium effect of oil. And the huge literature I've been talking, I talked about at the beginning, pretends that that doesn't matter. And in our conclusion, we try to make the case for, yeah, let's never ever ignore those things. That's how we did this paper. If you're gonna publish a pure theory paper, it has to have something hard. In it. The conceptual framework in your intrinsically empirical paper does not. It has to have a convincing story. Be careful with your notation. But a pub publishing a journal, an article like this is gonna be painful. Don't think it's gonna be easier than the pain associated with pressing run on your final, final empirical specification and hoping you get some few values. Okay. That's, the, that's the anguish of the empirical economist. The anguish here is you get an interesting problem, you're sure it's right, and you cannot achieve the convincing proof. That's how I've approached these problems. And that's mostly what I've done all these years, versions of this. Thank you guys. And I'll happily stay as long as you want with questions if you have any. All right, yeah, we have a couple of minutes. Oh yes, Thomas. How do you know when you've done enough work to make two papers instead of one big paper? Because there were some choices here where you said, we're gonna make a necessary assumption and on over here, we're gonna make a sufficient assumption to get us to where we need to go, but it could have been two different papers. It came down to your understanding of what this paper was. Please expand on that. Yes, thank you. Um, well, I never once in the case of this theory paper felt like it could have been two. I felt like we answered one question. Does either of these environmental restrictions imposed on a polluting industry possibly enrich the bad guys? Um, that felt like a question. Where we were more tempted was to start with this as part A of the paper and then put some empirical evidence at the second in the second half. It's always a struggle, and I've been doing this a long time, to know what is the least publishable unit. And there are people way more adept at it than I am. And if I were more adept, I would probably have more publications, but don't think about things that way enough, maybe. It's hard. It's hard. I mean, at one level, be mercenary, send out the least, send out the paper with the smallest element of new stuff and get it in print and use the second chunk of information that you already have for two papers. That's one way of looking at things. I'm not good at it. I'm not a good person to answer that question. Yeah, yeah. That's a follow-up question. Was, so a lot of us in this room are probably not going to write a pure theory paper. But I think, and I'll speak for myself, I'm tantalized by the thought of not just taking known theory and putting it in my theory section of my empirical paper, but 
playing with it. Like, here's my thought, here's how I modify it. Could you maybe speak a bit to like the extent to which you can put a bit of like novel idea into the theoretical model of an empirical paper? but not trying to create new proofs of like a new description of the world. Yeah, I'm thinking about a student I know of who's working on some stuff. I'm not sure how much I should say now, but let me put it this way. Um, is there a sort of bedrock theoretical uh, paper or tradition in the literature you're most likely to tackle in your dissertation? like a, a couple papers or a flurry of articles from the early 70s that everybody has to cite now, even though we've moved a long ways beyond that. I'm thinking of a couple articles. They might be theoretical mostly. So in the case I'm thinking about that, that two or three papers exist. And you might get a data set that says, for the country you're looking at, wait a second, that's not how things work at all. So your empirical discoveries, you, what you learn about the institutions and the empirical evidence in the setting where you're planning to do dissertation uh, research might make you realize, oh, wait a second. I studied those theory papers really carefully. That's not what's happening here. That's a place where you might have a chance to do more than just include a conceptual framework in your essentially empirical paper. Because evidence contrary to received theoretical wisdom in the scientific method is a reason for a new theory, right? It doesn't happen enough in economics. But if you have that opportunity and you have the inclination, then I'm inclined to say that that might be a golden opportunity to actually make a theoretical contribution. But if what you discover isn't different enough than that, then you can still illuminate the evidence in your data in a new light, maybe, with a theoretical framework that has a twist that makes it seem like, oh, these people aren't being stupid. They're doing this thing. They're using storing grain for this reason. It makes sense. But don't be blind to the possibility that some empirical evidence you come across will be sufficiently contrary to what everybody knows is true theoretically. That well, if you do have a theory, it happens. Sure. 